saying you better move your ass out of the way. Hello, wrestling friends. I'm Matt Coon, which means you're listening to FTR with Dax Harwood. And there he is, drinking coffee. We're recording in the morning. And dare I say, the, the two-time, I think, Wrestling Observer Newsletter award winner and also the happiest man in wrestling. Dax Harwood, how are you doing today, sir? Yeah, uh, still happy today, uh, unless you listen to some of the internet uh, wrestling community and read the, uh, read the reports. I am the most unhappy uh, man in the world. You know what's crazy is I want to take just a second to talk about that. Like I tweeted about it and said that uh, I get painted, and I have for years, man, uh, as being unhappy or hard to deal with or, or whatever, um, because I am oh, I stand up for myself, and that that's that's weird. You know, like um, I was talking to my friend CM Punk. You may have heard of him just the other day. And, you know, it, it's crazy. And I, I'm speaking for myself and not him. But in this industry, for so long, especially with only one place to go until just recently, uh, in this industry, with one place to go, you're always just supposed to fall in line. You're always supposed to do what, what, what you're told um, with no questions asked. And if you don't, if, if you, if you fight back just a little bit and fight back, maybe, uh, too, uh, abrasive of a term, but speak up, if you speak up, if you push back just a little bit, man, you get painted as, in a certain narrative and the, the ways they use that paint <laughs> is they go to the, the dirt sheets and they anonymously say, Oh, this he's unhappy and he's so difficult to work with. Uh, no, I just want the best for my career and for Cash's career too. And, you know, I, I've always wondered why, like I've never, I've never, uh, I've never gotten to any kind of, I've argued before with Tony. I've argued before with Bruce. I've argued before with Vince, um, Mark Carano. I've argued with these guys, but, but not to the point where, you know, it was like, your mom's a bitch. You know what I mean? Like it was me arguing my, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> <not>. <laughs> uh, but, but it's me arguing my point, you know, and why I think this might be better or this could work better. Um, and so, you know, in this industry, if you, if you try to, it seems like sometimes, if you try to be better or you try to better yourself or try to better your position um, and you do it without being a backbiter or backstabbing people in the back, if you do it face to face, man, you're labeled as difficult to work with or unhappy. But if you are a backstabber, you know, and you, know, you, you go behind people's backs, and maybe you know, cut their throat to the promoter or the booker, then uh, nothing ever gets said about you. It's just weird, man. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I think you would, you could attest to this, especially for as long as we've known each other. I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, I'm not just talking about my 19 years in wrestling. I'm talking about my 38 years on this earth. Um, I have, uh, I said it a million times, beautiful wife, beautiful daughter, uh, lucky enough, blessed enough, fortunate enough to have the house that I have. I'm not saying it's any kind of multi-million dollar house. I'm just saying a roof over my head. Uh, I, I'm lucky to have food in my belly. I'm a, I'm lucky that I'm able to provide for my family. And then on top of all of that, the, the fucking icing on the cake, I get to perform and do a job that I dreamed of when I was five years old. And you can't get any better than that. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 happy thing. I wanted to get that, get that out there. And as far as the wrestling uh, observer. Uh, newsletter award. Uh, so I want to give a little plug to my uh, friend on Twitter, uh, Rasslin Uploader Armstrong Alley on YouTube uh, at Chris K R I S P Lettuce. Um, he has for I don't know twelve or fifteen dollars. He has an incredible Google Drive with a ton of wrestling stuff, um, and I've bought it and sent it to a lot of friends. I've also sent friends to him. Uh, but 
<clears throat> I sent him some uh, some clips and some footage of our feud with the Briscoes for the year long feud from the time that we made our debut at the final battle and attacked him till the end uh, with the dog collar match. And uh, so winning that, what I'm saying is that encap encapsulates the whole feud because right. we're everything on TV. Right. And now, so I watched that and I'm like, Oh my God, this is an incredible feud. The, like the, the, the promos back and forth. Um, the, obviously the matches, but uh, the, the sit down interview that we did where they, they broke the uh, classe Azul, which was shoot classe Azul. Uh, uh, you know, that to me, and even clips from our show uh, after Jay passed away, but winning that for, for uh, feud of the year really did uh, surprise me. And I'm, I'm glad that we are able with that award to, um, to commemorate Jay and his, and his legacy in wrestling. And I'm glad that we were the last thing to, uh, you know, bookend his legacy. Right. The um, Observer Letters or the Observer Newsletter Awards led to a tweet by you because AEW tweeted congratulations to all the other winners and you tweeted something. It was kind of cryptic. You said, tell us it's April. April's coming up without telling us April's not coming up. And you copied the fact that they uh, everybody was congratulating except you guys. Uh, some people noticed that they had not yet congratulated the tag team champions and maybe they were doing it on the hourly. And they did do it on the hourly after your tweet, but they said congratulations for feud of the year to the Briscoes. Did not mention FTR. Um, first of all, did you really feel a little slighted that AEW wasn't uh, tweeting congratulations to you? And how did you feel when you saw the Briscoe tweet? Yeah, I, I did feel slighted. I can't lie. I mean, yeah, it, it was just because we worked so hard last year and we did you know, with the, what I feel was not the best content, not the best effort to maximize our momentum from last year. Um, I feel we did our best to make everything work <clears throat> and for them not to acknowledge us really did, you know, it, it hurt me a bit. Um, because, and I'm sure road dog will say I'm taking this too seriously. Uh, but it did hurt me a bit because I worked so hard last year, cash and I both worked so extremely hard to make 2022, uh, a year that, you know, will go down in, in the FTR history books, but you know, two things, I'm just so glad that they did at least acknowledge the Briscoes and give Jay that moment to shine. Uh, but the second thing was after I got my feelings hurt and probably rushed to tweet <laughs> instead of thinking about it and saying, Hey, just delete it. Don't, don't say anything. Um, I started thinking and I'm like, okay, we are a team that's got a little bit of buzz about us. We've been doing this for a while. Um, and we have no clue. They have no clue. More importantly, what our future is, is going to be. So should I really be upset at the fact that they, they omitted us because I don't know if I owned a company and I didn't know if, if my employee or my talent or whatever, wasn't going to be there in a month, would I highlight him or her? So, I, you know, or, you know, if I'm going to make a commercial and I own a, um, and I own a, you know, a, a carpent carpentry company. Right. Right. And my lead carpenter is going to go to my biggest competition in town. And I'm making a commercial uh, for television, local television. Not but that I, you're I, going to the biggest competition in town. That decision is not I'm saying, yeah, right. no, 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 hypothetically. Yeah, oosh, oosh, right. Thank you for saving that. Uh, but I'm saying when I highlight him, because if I highlight him and these people see that he's at the other company and eh, maybe I'm a. Uh, shooting myself in the foot. So I started thinking about it and I, and I, and I said, you know what? I can't blame them. I don't, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Well, everybody is saying also that because of the tweet and because of everything, it's like this big work. You, uh, AEW has got a pay-per-view coming up and on Wednesday night, this, this show drops on Wednesday on Wednesday night, there's a casino battle Royal where there's uh, tag teams 
And the winner is going to be part of this four-way tag team match at the AW pay-per-view. And that maybe you guys will be the Joker. And this is all just a big work to get people to believe that, you know, there's an issue with you guys. What do you say to that feedback from people? I mean, uh, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't tell you the truth. I wouldn't want to do that to AW. I wouldn't want to do that to us. Whatever that truth is, um, whether we'll be there in the battle reel or, or not, uh, I wouldn't want to to ruin that for anybody, uh, the fans included. So uh, I'll say just watch Wednesday and we'll see. But to be clear, your intention of the tweet was not as part of a work, though. No, absolutely not. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. No way. I uh, I was legitimately <laughs> I was legitimately a crybaby and got my feelings <laughs> while I was in the gym mid set. I screenshotted every uh, every <laughs> award that they had posted, and then I post. And then um, I mean, I I had a feeling, you know, uh, that we weren't going to get mentioned because, like I said, we have reached out and said, Hey, we will come back and work until our contracts are up. You know, um, we're okay with it. We, we took, uh, a couple months off to let our bodies heal, to, to think about what we wanted to do. Um, right. And so we've made it known that we will gladly come back, uh, at least at the very least, you know, till our contracts are up or until we can come to some you know, middle ground or, or, or not. And, and, you know, leave, but, um, haven't necessarily heard anything back. So I had it, I had a feeling they were not very happy with us. Well guys, uh, I guess this is a great commercial for AW dynamite, uh, tonight as the show, uh, drops in the morning and dynamites at night, but there's another show coming up. And that is the live show of FTR with Dax Harwood at the Millennium Biltmore in Los Angeles, the biggest wrestling weekend of the year. It's at 8 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, it's a great way to kick off your Mania weekend. Um, are you still excited about this show? Do you have some plans? Do you have some ideas of what we're going to do? How are you feeling about it? Yeah, I'm excited, but I think the more I think about it and try to like uh, try to schedule things in my head, uh, I get nervous because I don't know. I've always been this way, dude. Like, uh, I've never the only thing, and you know, some people might think I'm patting myself on the back. The only thing I've ever been good at without working for it has been wrestling. That's it. Basketball, I had to work my ass off to get decent at that. Football, the same thing. School, the exact same thing. I had like it, nothing just came to me. And so, with right. this, you know, <laughs> we're there's no practice with me and you for this, you know. Uh, right. So, it's it's our first live show. Uh, I'm very nervous because I want to make sure the fans uh, get their money's worth, but also uh, I owe everything, every bit of success, quote unquote success that I have, or everything that my family has, I owe it all to them, to the fans. And I want to be able to give back to them. And so I hope this little bit of, um, uh, this this little bit of, a, of camaraderie me and the fans are gonna have, and you, you too, you and the fans, can give back to them for everything they've given to me. Well, it's gonna be an exciting time. We do have a lot of cool stuff planned. Of course, we've announced some guests. There will be some surprise guests. There will be some announced guests. We announced that Cash Wheeler last week on the show. We announced that he's going to be part of it, of course, going to do it out of cash. And then on Twitter on Monday, we announced that Powerhouse Hobbs is coming to be a guest on the show. Uh, what is the relationship with FTR and Powerhouse Hobbs? So that goes back quite a bit. Uh, I think he'll tell you. Uh, that also combined, obviously, with his look and his talent. Now, I'm not taking anything away from him, but I think he, he would probably tell you the reason he has the job today is because of me and Dan. We saw him uh, when we were in Daly's place. We saw him. He, I think he may have been working with Scorpio Sky, who is an incredible talent, too. Man, I miss him. And 
you know, one of my sidebar here, one of my what I think is our best AEW tag matches was us against Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian. Uh, I love, love, love that match. It was when we were doing the brush with greatness uh, for the tag belt. But anyway, he had this great match with Scorpio Sky. He had a great match with um, with uh, uh, Orange Cassidy. And I don't mean a five-star, 30-minute, uh, million kickouts uh, at 2.999. What I mean was he came in to do a job, and he had three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes to do the job. And in those minutes, he showed both me and Dan something that we didn't see AEW had at the time. Uh, and, 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 you know, so we, we pulled him, pulled him aside afterwards and talked to him and, and told him how well he did. And then we all just started talking and we exchanged numbers. We became very, very good friends. He's one of my best friends in, in the business. Now he called me on my way to Charleston last week and we talked for a while on the phone. Uh, you know, he's got an incredible life story, an incredible life story that I hope he tells. And I think he will on the live event. Uh, and we've been through a lot of shit together. Whenever I was going through my anxiety, uh, my anxiety, uh, issues, he and I talked every single day, multiple times a day. We checked up on each other because we were both going through them at the same time. And I hope he doesn't mind me saying that. And I'm sure we'll talk about it on the live event too. So there's a lot of, uh, history with, uh, powerhouse Hobbs. Okay. And FTR. Yeah. I didn't know that I, I, powerhouse Hobbs, you know, he made his debut and he just keeps getting better and bigger and better. And uh, the shape he's in now is incredible. He seems to be someone AW has in the chamber that could be shot to the top anytime that they wanted, but he's joining us live. We hope you will too go to FTR with Dax.com for tickets. And we're going to have an awesome time. Uh, Dax, we talked earlier today off the air about some other special guests we had. Are we ready to confirm those guests yet or not? Uh, let's don't confirm them yet. Let's just say I am in the process of texting them literally, literally right now. We're going to get to the show today. We're talking about the pinnacle. That was something we were going to save for the live show, but we wanted to give you this on FTR with Dax Harwood because the live show is filling up. And in your words, as you texted me, you said, fuck it, let's do the pinnacle. So we're going to talk about the pinnacle today, but first, Dax Harwood, our t- wait, our it's the morning. We're not yes. crazy people. Our coffee of the week. We're doing a coffee of the week this week. Yeah, uh, it, right now as we speak, it is nine forty three a.m. and we had decided to. We had some technical difficulties, but we decided decided to start this at nine a.m. this morning. And there is no way in the world that i could drink that early <laughs> no um, no you got a whole day was, ahead of us man we got, got a yeah. whole day ahead yeah. of us and i'm not going to start drinking this early um and plus if i drink at 9 45 in the morning that's one of my drinks down and i only have one to go and uh i can't do that i gotta unwind towards the end of the day so coffee of the week everyone knows for a long uh, i hope everyone knows for a very long time that i've been a huge connoisseur of coffee i love it uh I love finding new uh, new coffee shops to go to when we're around um, uh, these different towns. And real quick, uh, Cash and I, before COVID hit, our plan was to get a whole bunch of recording stuff. And every town we went to when we were with WWE, we were going to take a um, take a, a camera in, and uh, we were going to rate each coffee. Uh, and in different coffee shops and not, not really rate them, but just highlight these coffee shops. And that was going to be a YouTube show, but then COVID hit and everything you know, turned to shit. But today, um, I want to highlight my absolute favorite coffee I have ever had Here we go. Uh, from my absolute favorite coffee shop in the entire world. It's summit coffee for foundry street, Asheville, North Carolina and the river arts district. The inside is so incredible, so beautiful. Um, the baristas are s- extremely knowledgeable, but also extremely friendly. Um, and they always, <clears throat> they're always busy, um, but they always make time for each customer. You know, it, it, it's a great place. Anyway, my favorite one, and they won't have this one forever uh, because what they do is they send a team. Summit is all around the Carolinas, some in Georgia. Um, 
uh, maybe one in Tennessee. I can't remember. But anyway, they send a team to these different parts of the world to find the best quality beans. And they buy those beans and they bring them back and and their uh, their roastery they roast their own beans. Uh, this one is well, me and the baristas have a joke call it Kesha, but it's actually uh, Chesha natural. It's a light roast, and um, this one does have the kick of coffee, but also like a syrupy, uh, dark chocolate kind of caramel taste. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll, uh, I can't really sniff it now because it's been in my cup a little too long. So I do it a disservice, but I can take a, uh, a little sip here. He's sipping the taste. coffee folks. So even after 30 minutes in my cup, not as hot, dude, uh, you still taste the, the, the brown sugar ish. Uh, you know, a hint of brown sugar, obviously the coffee Ford hit, uh, coffee Ford taste. Um, but it's, it's incredible. I, it, you know, I would, I would, uh, beg you guys to go to summitcoffee.com, check out all their coffees and you could even read the history of how these were, uh, harvested and things like that and, and where they went to, to get them. Um, but it's, it's incredible. Summitcoffee.com. Try their Chesha, C-Y-E-S-H-A, Chesha Natural. Before that, before I ever had this one, uh, my favorite was their Kilimanjaro. Try that one as well. It's a little darker of a roast. Uh, but yeah, uh, coffee for me, uh, way more important in life than tequila, which is crazy. Well, it's summitcoffee.com. And of course, if you're drinking coffee in the morning, and you're drinking tequila at night, you're probably doing it right. Uh, if you drink coffee at night, that's not going to help you get a great night's sleep. But you know what, Will? Uh, try miracle.com because whether you want to be more fit, a better parent, or get more done at work, there is one thing that will help, and that's better sleep. With Miracle Made Sheets, you can tap into the power of self-cooling temperature regulation, which has shown to improve sleep quality by up to 34%. Now, for me, I love these sheets. I've been using them for over a week, and it is true. They regulate the temperature, and it's like getting a little hug from your sheets. Uh, what they do is they use silver-infused fabrics originally developed by NASA. Miracle-made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night, so you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with natural silver that prevent 99% of bacterial growth. That means they're self-cleaning, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable. That is true, folks. They're amazing. Without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They're better for your skin. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets mean less bacteria to clog your pores and fewer breakouts and other skin problems. Go to trymiracle.com slash DAX to try it today. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. This is a great deal, guys. Save over 40% and be sure to use our promo code DAX to save even more and get three towels. So go to trimiracle.com slash DAX. Use our promo code DAX. And by the way, they're so confident in their product, they offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. What have you got to lose? So if you weren't 100% satisfied with this product, you get a free refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trimiracle.com slash DAX. And use the code DAX to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash DAX to treat yourself. Uh, DAX, have you tried your sheets yet? I have tried them. Last week, you know, I told you I didn't have a chance to because my mail was running too late. And uh, as soon as I got them, uh, I threw them on the bed the next day. And my favorite thing, of course, okay. Let's be honest here. When you hear these things like self-regulating, cooling uh, properties, like you, you're like, ah, come on, dude. Right. They're sheets, yeah. you know? How can this happen? But I'm telling you, I and, and it's been really warm here in the Carolinas over the last week, like super warm. It got up to the to uh, the, the the high 70s. So, you know, I was like, yeah, well, we'll see. So I tried them out, and I am a, you know, constant sweater at nighttime. And I'll be damned if – the sweat was completely reduced. I'm not going to say that I didn't sweat at all, but 
compared to waking up and thinking you pissed yourself. Uh, and that's being a <laughs> very gross, but, uh, this was, this was awesome. Dude. It really, really was Maria's favorite thing is the, she doesn't have to wash them every single week. Uh, one, because I'm not sweating all over them, but two, because of the, the, the bacteria fighting properties they have as well. Uh, but for me, uh, getting a better night's sleep because I'm not uncomfortable when I'm sleeping is the best, uh, thing that could happen. And that is try miracle.com slash Dax. Now Dax, you got it all out of the way and we are ready to start talking about the pinnacle. Um, we're going to talk a bit about a few things, including something that Sean Spears, uh, tweeted about the pinnacle as well after we made the announcement. Uh, uh but speaking of Sean Spears early on in AEW, um, Tully Blanchard was kind of the on-screen manager of Sean Spears. And then Tully Blanchard came on with you and, but there wasn't really much cross pollination. You didn't see you guys together was how soon, how early on was there talk kind of a, a faction with you guys kind of centered on Tully Blanchard kind of tying you guys together? Uh, n- not at all. I mean, I think our idea with Spears too was, was to stay separate. Uh, we wanted to have Tolly, obviously, because of the uh, comparisons we got with Arn and Tolly. So, uh, when we talked about the Young Bucks episode, <clears throat> the one thing we did forget to talk about was the uh, tag team appreciation night, which is right. one of my favorite things I've ever done in wrestling. Uh, the rating was great for that too. I was very proud of it. But you know, I I had written that thing out, you know, with with help from the Bucks and. and cash too but that was something i was very very uh proud of because we got to acknowledge uh arn and tolly possibly the greatest heel tag team of all time uh and we got to acknowledge the rock and roll express possibly the greatest babyface tag team of all time and two tag teams that were compared to us and um the young bucks respectively so I was, you know, I was, I was very happy about that. And that's kind of how I wanted the transition to be for, for Tully, uh, because that's where we officially turned heel in that segment where we, uh, we hit Robert with the, uh, Tully, Tully got upset or whatever. And him and Arn had words right? and he had words with, um, with uh, Ricky and Spears came and pulled Tully away. And we hit Robert with my knee brace and gave Ricky the most beautiful spike pile driver of all time. Ricky Morton got to be the greatest working baby face ever. Got to be right. Right. Uh, but we hit him with the spike pile driver and that's what officially turned us heel. Um, and then I wanted, I didn't want there to be like this big reveal that he was our manager. I just wanted it to subtly happen. But uh, as we talked about before in TV wrestling, it's not all focused on you. And so it happened a little too subtly. We just walked out and one you know, the next week and Tully was our manager. I wish there could have been some sort of uh, backstage thing where we introduced Tully and got to talk and allowed him to do, you know, what he was, um, what, what, you know, what could highlight him. And that's speaking because he's an incredible speaker. Um, but we didn't get that opportunity. We only were able to have him walk out and that's how we introduced him. So to answer your question, there was no talk of, of combining the three of us or the, or even the five of us, you know, from later down the road. Uh, it was just something where we thought Tully was a great fit for us and would give us a little bit of a, a rub, uh, because we wanted eventually to go down as the greatest tag team of all time. And he's Tully, you know, and, uh, founding member of the four horsemen, a lot, uh, of questions on Twitter about this and a lot of questions from everybody about this. When you first joined AEW, there was a lot of talk and there always has been a lot of talk about a new four horsemen about, and it would be centered around you guys. And then maybe at beginning, maybe it'd be Cody, you know, or, or somebody else, but definitely you guys. And then the top of the line champ, let's say it was Cody and kind of your mid mid champ, your Tully of the group, did you ever have any interest in using that four horsemen moniker in AW? You mean the, the name? The name, yeah. No, God, no. Um, even even when Arn 
got the rights to the name the horseman. There, no way, uh, because there will never be another four horsemen. And if you know, aside from the Barry incarnation, every incarnation of the horseman after Oli became less and less and less and less. Uh, and so with the comparisons, it was already really hard for me and cash because of the comparisons to Arn and Tully anyway, you know, because people would compare to them and they said, Oh, but they're not as good. And that was, you know, really hard to get over. Right. So you could imagine, uh, if we were a brand new group called the four horsemen, uh, how hard that would be to escape you know, their, their shadow and there, there's no way anybody can do that. So no, uh, absolutely no way. I will say though, we did talk to, to Cody a lot about forming a group with him. Uh, and this was before Max came along. Really? Yeah. Yeah. We, we talked to Cody a lot about it. It was, you know, he had Arn, we had Tully and we wanted to create the super group with, with Cody, us two, and we had some ideas of who could be the other members. I think at that time, around that time, Brock was starting to come up too. So Brock was uh, an Brock idea. Anderson, and, right? Yeah, Brock Anderson, yes. Um, and we felt that if Brock were with us, we could he, he could stand outside of the ring and watch us, you know, and and, and if we had eight man tags, uh, he would be able to learn by standing on the apron getting in just for a few minutes and tagging back out. And then we could talk to him afterwards and tell him why certain things happened and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but we, we really wanted to, but I, you know, and I think Cody really wanted to as well, but I, I think that Cody was uh, vehemently, vehemently. Is that the word? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, that is the word. <laughs> against being a heel, at least at that time. Well, that horseman talk is something that everybody's talked about, and I'm glad we finally have the answers. Uh, March 7th, 1920, 2021. Sorry, I'm old. Um, AEW Revolution, FTR is not on the card. The next dynamite was uh, March 10th, 2021. This is the beginning of the pinnacle. It was the result of Jericho and MJF losing their tag team match against the Bucks. So then Jericho calls it inner circle war council, but it's all a big setup or a double setup. It's, it's a little complicated, but it kind of worked. You know, it was MGF appeared to be trying to turn all the members of the inner circle against Chris Jericho. And uh, he was secretly doing it. Looked like he was going to be successful. Turns out Jericho knew about it and they were all about to beat up MJF, but then the lights turn out. And they come back on in the ring was Wardlow, FTR, Tully Blanchard, and Sean Spears. There's a big uh, brawl. Uh, Spears hit Sammy Guevara with a chair. Uh, you hit Hager with a bottle. FTR, both y'all, uh, handcuffed Ortiz and Santana. Uh, FTR and Blanchard gave Ortiz and Santana a double pile driver. Um, MGF hit Jericho with his own bat. Uh, they all carried Jericho to the stage. Wardlow power bombed Jericho off the stage and through a table and Jericho was covered in blood as the show ended. That's quite a debut for the pinnacle. First of all, what did you think about that debut? Oh, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was great. I loved the fact that, uh, we were able to give Tully some shine because when you, when you have a manager that, that like that, um, there has to be a reason for him. You know, there has to be, he has to be a difference maker. And uh, for us, because I think when, uh, Cash and I both picked up uh, uh, Santana and Ortiz each, you know, and, he, right. uh, and, and totally came off and spiked both of them. And I just was elated at that. But, but that's how you get a, that's how you get a group over. That's how you get a faction over. That's how you get anybody over, uh, especially heels. Because uh, they have to, we talked about this maybe last week or the week before, I can't remember, but uh, you have to present a threat as a heel. The Horsemen did that for months and months and months, uh, NWO as well, months and months and months where they just laid everybody out. You know? Killed everybody. Killed them all. And right. that's how you present a threat. Um, but 
we'll, we'll talk about. Well, <laughs> it, it changes quickly, but now let's talk about the planning behind the scenes, your FTR. And all of a sudden you're part of the pinnacle. When were you approached? How was it brought to you? What did you think of this plan to be injected into this MJF Jericho feud as part of a very horseman like group, the pinnacle? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, I think Max was, uh, I think at the time Max was looking forward to working with me and Dan. And obviously we were looking forward to working with Max too. We'd had like a Twitter exchange, uh, before that, before we even came to AEW, um, about, you know, eventually one day we'll get, we'll work together or something. Uh, but we were, you know, I think, uh, you know, he saw the potential, uh, that he, and uh, you know all of us had to to work together but the idea was brought to me by tony um he wanted a dangerous alliance slash four horsemen type group um and and jericho jericho was the you know one of the guys that came up and said that he wanted this group to be formed so we could work with uh inner circle so i think the you know Max told me he wanted to work with me and cash. Um, and he felt at the time we were the only heels working as heels. Um, Tony was on board with the idea, but Jer- I think Jericho is the actual one that told me about the group, uh, and wanting to work with the inner circle. What expectations do you have? What plans, uh, were told to you about what the pinnacle was going to be? Well, I, you know, my expectations were super high. I was excited, especially after that night. Uh, the plans, the, all, all I knew was the, uh, the, the group was going to be formed. Cash and I would break off and work with, we were supposed to get this long feud with Santana Ortiz that was supposed to get, you know, uh, a lot of TV time. And we were super, that was the team we were looking forward to working with uh the most at the time were those guys absolutely yeah. and uh, i mean they're you know both incredible wrestlers a great tag team and uh you know after that night and after what we had accomplished uh i was super excited for the future i thought it was a great way to introduce uh a heel group a great way to put some steam behind us and i say us all of us but you know specifically speaking for myself and cash like uh, I feel that we needed a spark at that time. I don't think that our tag team title reign was the best. I mean, I think at the time it was, you know, uh, and up until just recently, it was the shortest reigning tag team title reign ever in AEW. And a few months had passed. Yes. And we had, we were, we did nothing of substance up until then. So, it, you know, it gave us a spark. Um, Ronnie uh, or Sean Spears, someone who I've talked glowingly about his in-ring um, credentials, how great he is as a as a ring technician um, and a ring general too. It gave him something as well. You know, finally gave him a little kick in the ass. Uh, and Wardlow, who had been a killer all the way through his AW career, looked even more badass. So I th- I thought it was you know I thought the way that we debuted was spot on. Absolutely. And it, it, it led to a lot of hype and a lot of talk and people were excited, a lot of talk online. And they follow up the next week on March 17th, Dynamite with a promo by MJF uh, with the Pinnacle. Um, he said he was the most charismatic guy in pro wrestling. He <laughs> was uh, <laughs> he was uh, uh, he was only 25 years old and he didn't want to play second fiddle to Jericho. Talk some mad crap about Jericho. But then he started talking about FTR and Sean Spears and Tully Blanchard. And um, Meltzer called it a legit Hall of Fame promo uh, to in, introduce his new group. It seemed like on that Dynamite, you know, I said Horseman, you said Dangerous Alliance. I don't, you probably remember. I don't know if people do out there. But I remember Heyman introducing the dangerous alliance he's going one at a time he's going everybody's credentials it really rang like that right it looked like we're on the custom special it's like oh shit this is a super group yep uh that's exactly what i how i felt it you know looked on that saturday night from the dangerous alliance but the only difference was 
Max was the one doing all the talking and Tolly was just sitting there. So, you know, I told you, you know, the, the, the previous week, uh, as if you have a manager, the manager has to be a difference maker in your career, right? Right, right. Because if he's not a difference maker in your career, then why is he there? He's DiBiase, DiBiase with the NWO. Yeah, or DiBiase with the even the the million dollar uh, Ma- the uh, uh, what was it? 1995. Beef, yeah, uh, Beefcake and Hogan, right? Well, no, 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 no. no. the million dollar uh, group that they had, the million dollar team. Oh my God! Oh, yeah, with yeah, Tatanka and Nikolai Volkov and that, Nikolai Volkov, <laughs> and then eventually one, two, three, kid, and uh, you and love some Sid. new generation. My God! Yeah. Uh, but but you know, so that's why me and Cash. We always would try to, uh, we would sacrifice us and sacrifice our cool stuff, quote unquote, to give something to Tully always, whether it was in the match with, you know, we'll talk about it later, but with Darby and Sting, where Tully was the factor and the reason we, you know, the, the, the reason the match ended, uh, we always gave him time to talk because if we didn't, then our group was dead the water because it was, then it was just three people together. So before this promo, you know, uh, I remember talking to Max and I said, Hey, I think we should allow Tully to do something. Some of the talking because that promo was fucking 10 minutes long or whatever. And, uh, Max was like, no, no, well, you know, I, I'm really, uh, I really think I should do the talking, all the talking. I'm like, yeah, but we've got one of the greatest talkers of all time, Tully Blanchard, and he's our manager, and he's the reason we're all tied together. I think he should say a little something. Uh, Max didn't see that my way, and so Tully just sat in back, and so did everybody else. Uh, Max, MJF, he, by most accounts, loves wrestling, has an appreciation for the history of wrestling. But does his appreciation of wrestling go back to the 80s where he appreciates a Tully Blanchard? Or um, was that something you felt he didn't really understand about Tully? Uh, I f- think he probably appreciates wrestling then, you know, uh, the 80s wrestling. But as young, you know, and it's not just him, but a lot of the people, a lot of the, the, the younger generation now, won't take time to look back and s- ask or see why these guys are so successful because Tully doesn't have, you know, a long list of quote unquote five star matches. And now I think that's what a lot of the, the wrestlers equate uh, who is great by having great matches, but that's not the case all the time. Uh, that is part of it. But also, especially in the 80s, it was how can I draw the most money or how can my uh, angle, how can my feud uh, be the top in the promotion? And if you watch Tolly's stuff, man, God dang, uh, there weren't many uh, angles. And I'm even saying this with Flair in mind, too, dude, like that were as hot as his. I, this is my opinion. I think his angle with Dusty was hotter than Flair's angle with Dusty. I think Flair may have had the better "quote unquote" wrestling matches with Dusty, uh, but I think the 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 angle. And he, you know, there was twice that he did the angle with Dusty because Dusty knew Tully was money. Right. Uh, but I think the angles with Dusty were were much hotter. Uh, and had more heat behind them. Uh, the angle, obviously, with um, Magnum TA, incredible, dude. Like, Baby doll and all that stuff. W- what what an angle, man. Um, and and that's what makes a good heel. You know, those are the things that makes a good heel. And then you transition to him and uh, Arn working with the Rock and Roll Express, you know, and defending the belts against them or um, it, it, or win, winning the belts from the Rock and Roll Express. And not to mention, you know, uh, his feud with Ronnie Garvin really yeah, propped yeah. Ronnie Garvin up. Ronnie yeah. Garvin would have never been in a position later on to be the NWA world champion beating Ric Flair had he didn't have that. It was a super hot angle with Ronnie Garvin and, you know, I love, uh, I love Jimmy, Gar- or Jimmy yeah. Valiant and Miss uh, Georgia Lively and the whole deal. And, you know, 
going back to to Tolly and uh, Steamboat. He kept running from Steamboat because he was trying to right. uh, waste the time off the clock. Could you imagine someone doing that now and having to sacrifice their moves because <laughs> right. they're just trying to get over the fact that they're chicken shit? Right. Uh, and you know, so I think he probably had appreciation for Tolly. Uh, I don't think he understood the magnitude. I don't think he understands the magnitude of how big Tolly Blanchard actually is and how important he actually is to the sport and to the business of professional wrestling. Now let's talk about something else about this because the next week on Dynamite, you guys with Sean Spears as, as the part of the pinnacle defeated Brian Pillman Jr., uh, Griff Garrison, and Dante Martin. Um, one of the things that helped with the Horsemen and maybe didn't work with other groups, but definitely worked with NWO is there was a time and a point where there would be a match against people at the level at the time of Pillman, Garrison, and Dante, where they would just steamroll those guys. Uh-huh. They would steamroll. Like if Flair had a one-on-one match, it, it it was apparent he was the guy. If Tully had a one-on-one match with a, with a mid-card person, it was apparent he was better. Do you think today in wrestling, I know you said recently that you didn't, don't really think squashes have a, have a, have a place in wrestling but don't you think there needs to be some kind of superiority placed upon these heel guys that they're actually credible in some way so to correct you just a little bit uh and if i did say this i didn't mean it that way i do think that there i think that there is a place for squash matches i understand why there isn't squash matches on tv a lot because you know people change the channels and and now we're working towards uh we're working towards ratings than we are drawing in the next house. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I think there is a place for squash matches. Um, you know, I felt that and I remember this match. I thought <clears throat> that Wardlow should be out there with us, which I think he was. And I thought and felt that, Max should have been in the match with us as well to show us as a group, you know, to show us as a, a unit. Um, you know, uh, it, there were a ton of times flair was in six mans or eight mans with the horsemen, you know? Uh, and I felt that, uh, Max should be out there with us, but he thought otherwise and didn't think he should. I thought up to that point as well between us spears Max, um, out of that, those names at the time, only one person was seeing a ton of TV time and that was Max. So I thought that if you put me in cash with Spears in a match, then it really was just three guys who hadn't had much TV time, who hadn't been on TV very much. But if we added that fourth guy into the match, if we added Max and that would give us a little bit more star power, make us look a little more, a little bit more credible, um, and make us look more like a unit. But he didn't see things that way, so we had the six man. Uh, a lot of things to talk about with this rise and fall of the pinnacle. One thing you mentioned was characters and just establishing your characters the way that you think they should be established. But another thing is is booking, and I think that goes to the next week. I suppose the idea is that. You guys beat up Jericho and company so badly. They're off TV for a while. And on the 331 Dynamite, MJF was backstage with you. He brought the whole pinnacle. He brought a stylist. So, of course, like you do in every company, they fit you with expensive clothes. And um, and apparently it was the old inner circle dressing room. He said they need to fix the men's bathroom because of the smell. And they opened the door. Jericho, Santana, Ortiz, Sammy Guevara were in the bathroom. MJF tried to escape, open the front door, but Hager was there, punched MJF. It turned into a big brawl. Um, uh, Hager fought with Wardlow, slammed through the massage table in the training room. Santana Ortiz knocked Cash into an ice bath and uh, hit Dash Harwood. Oh, that goddamn Meltzer. Hit mm-hmm. Dax Harwood with a broken chair leg. Harwood was, you were bleeding. Um, and... Uh, and Jericho took MJF in the bathroom and put his head in the toilet and flushed it. Jericho told MJF the worst is yet to come. He then threw MJF into a Pepsi machine and threw the glass. He poured a little bit of bubbly on MJF, and the inner circle took over the dressing room. Y'all got beat down. Feud over. <laughs> right? Like, 
Isn't that it? Isn't that how it works? Like that's redemption. You talk all the time, redemption. That's it. It's over, right? I could not agree with you more. Uh, so real quick, I was bleeding. Uh, Jericho took a picture frame off of the wall. And while my back was turned, hit me in the head with the picture frame. I don't know if you can still see it. I'll try to show you. Just sort of, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's something there. Yeah. And it was, I was bleeding profusely. And uh, so, yeah. What was that? Was that two weeks after the pinnacle had formed? I think it was three weeks. I think it was a good three weeks, but no interactions, no face to face, just promos by MJF. And again, you and I have not talked about this at all. I'm telling you as a fan perspective, I was like, this is hot. This is hot. And then all of a sudden this happened. I personally lost interest in it because like I said, it's where's there to go from here. There's no more threat, right? There's no more threat. We've got the shit kicked out of us. um, And the redemption story is over, you know, he flushed um, his head in the toilet. <laughs> like, what do you, what do you do after that? What do you do after the, like the head, the toilet should be like a year later. So, uh, so, you know, all the baby faces beat up the heels. And so a fan sitting at home, almost, I would say 99.9% of the audience has never had a wrestling match. Right. Uh, and so after the good guys get their redemption and beat us up, why is there a match? You know, why do we have a match? Um, the match is where they beat us up, you know, and that's where they, they get their redemption eventually down the road. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I thought that we prematurely, uh, got, uh, iced, you know, we were so hot with that debut that debut couldn't have gone any better. I don't think. Um, and then, you know, a f- couple of weeks later, they, they got their redemption. So <clears throat> my thought is, is why, why is there a match after this? Because we've already been beat up. You know, you, you, you literally beat, you put Wardlow through a table. Uh, you, I was busted wide open. Cash got dumped into a, uh, an ice bath, which was a shoot ice bath. Uh, I got stabbed in the head with a, um, uh, piece sure, like, of chair yeah. and then Max got beat up so bad. He had his head flushed down the toilet, went through a, you know, a uh, fucking drink gimmick. I can't remember what it was. Uh, so yeah, you know, what would we do? What would we do from here? That was my thought. My, my, you know, why? Um, I think that, we for so long have seen the WWE style of booking where the baby face always prevails. Right. I mean, more often than not, uh, and it's worked, you know, for years, it's worked for Vince for years, but the more often than not, the baby face always prevails. He may have a slight hiccup for a week, but he, you know, always come look how Roman was booked, you know, in 2019 or whatever. 2018, 2019, right. Always, always on top. Always, you know, he never, no one ever felt worried for him except for with Brock, you know, but everybody feels worried when you're working with Brock wrestling, Brock or fighting Brock. Um, but that's kind of why the fans turned on him at the time and nothing to his, you know, his fault. They just had nothing to cheer. It's kind of like the Superman effect, you know, Superman does have kryptonite, but uh, other than that, man, he's bulletproof, right? And he, he could beat the shit out of everybody. And so that's why the Batman movies make so much more money than the Superman movies, because there's more for Batman to fight against. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I felt that, you know, I felt that put us back a few steps. Did you feel that way before it was executed when you were told the plans? Um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, because it, you know, and look, I could be completely wrong. I may be completely wrong. I'm a nerd for eighties wrestling. I'm a nerd for, I mean, that's what I grew up on. You know, uh, I'm a nerd for nineties wrestling too. And, and looking at the style that was booked in those days, that's what I've studied. Right. And that's, and you know, uh, the Rocky Balboa storyline is kind of what, you know, uh, I, 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 tend to like my wrestling to follow. 
Uh, so I thought, and again, going back to the WWE style of booking and, and stuff like that, uh, the baby face is always prevailing every single week, always prevailing. Um, as heels, we've got to have heat behind us. And we did for one week. We had that big, huge debut where finally myself and Spears, who had barely made TV, we finally got some heat behind us. Uh, Max had been on TV with Wardlow in his corner, of course. He'd been on TV you know, every week, so he had a little bit of heat behind him. But we needed to be positioned as a threat to the company. You know what I mean? To and I don't mean the company as Tony Khan. Tony Khan. I mean the company as to all the baby faces. We need to look, be looked at as a threat. So when we are beaten up, so when we when we are defeated, it makes everybody. But uh, yeah, you know, going into it, I, I thought it was a bit premature uh, because of my, what I, you know, my booking brain. But I hadn't lost faith in what was going to happen because I, you know. I was surrounded by talented guys. And as far as you knew at that point, what was going to happen was going to be what we're working towards is blood and guts. Uh, no, I, I don't. I think there may have been rumors at the time of blood and guts, but no one knew when that was going to happen. Um, all I knew and all I was like uh, putting my hope forward or hope toward was uh, the, the, feud with Santana and Ortiz the next week the inner circle comes out to celebrate their victory Chris Jericho to the talking and basically did a great promo according to Meltzer he ran down the whole group uh including saying Tully Blanchard was just a third level horseman behind old Hina Ed of Paul Roma you know it just seems like a, a victory lap doesn't it that's what it seems like. That's how it sounds like, especially with you, the way you're detailing it. Um, but at that time, did you still feel good about this thing and where it's headed? Uh, and if it changed, when did it change? I think I maybe started having reservations at this point uh, because I don't think we had, I don't think we were on the show at all that week. No. Uh, right? Yeah. No. So that's when I started having reservations uh, <clears throat> because we had gotten beat up, gotten embarrassed. Um, I mean, every one of us. And uh, there was no follow up. But uh, yeah, I, that's when I started thinking, like, oh man, maybe there's you know something up here. We need to we need to all get together because uh, that's when I started feeling a little different. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how you uh, maybe felt, you know, like it was becoming FTR was window dressing for MJF and uh, uh, Jericho. But I'll tell you what's not window dressing. This is a terrible, terrible segue. But guys, Manscaped. Support for FTR is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Their products are engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer to you. 20% and free worldwide shipping with the code DAX at manscaped.com. Uh, you know, DAX, the cool thing is with Manscaped, you talked about it last time, this is before they made their big announcement of their new product, the Beard Hedger, that you, you know, you use the same thing for everything, you know, use the same Manscaped product. But now we have the Beard Hedger. I haven't received mine yet. I have the other Manscaped stuff and it's all great, but I can't wait to get this Beard Hedger because I hate the 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 clippers that you have, the, the clipper that you take off and you put on. This one's adjustable. And who better to advertise a facial hair product, the launch of a brand new facial hair product than Dax Harwood. Are, are you excited about the beard hedger? Yes, for sure. Because trying to find my, so, okay. I, I think that <laughs> this is, uh, this mustache is 
part of the gimmick, right? So the mustache has to be perfect. I don't mean like pristine and beautiful because there ain't nothing on this body head to toe pristine and beautiful. But what I mean is it's got to make sure to match the look and the feel of what Dax Harwood is and who Dax Harwood is. So if I let it grow too long and too scraggly, yeah, I'll look might look like a hippie, but if I have it too short, I'm a little, it might look like an office guy or a, uh, or a bus driver or something. Um, so I have to have it perfectly uh, I have to have it perfectly thick, just like I like Maria's ass, perfectly thick. Perfect. And, to, yeah. <laughs> and to, to do that is easy because I can slide the uh, hedger up and down as what, whatever I need to go. If it's not, you know, if I, if I, if I, uh, if I don't put enough on there and it's still too long, I just take one click, turn it down and there we go. We're perfect to go. I've been waiting for a uh, clipper like this for a long time because either you have the one that you take off and on, or you have the one that slides up and down. This uh, one, it, it's the worst because I never get it right. right. I never get it right. And, but this, and, you, and you accidentally slide it, uh, slide it down a little bit and uh, it too much. That's the yeah, worst. Yeah. And then you have to start over again. Yes. And then Dax needs a new gimmick, but he won't need a new gimmick, guys, because it, look at this new product by Manscaped. Today is a day. If you're looking for a new thing, a new way to cut your beard, if you're looking for a better product, you can get it from manscaped.com. You can get it 20% off plus free shipping with code DAX. Of course, if you haven't yet, make sure to get their, you know, products they're known for, the Performance Package 4.0, because um, you'll get two free gifts and the Manscaped Boxers, the Shed Travel Bag. But guys, check out this Beard Hedger. Use the promo code DAX, get 20% off. Today's the day. Get 20% off in free shipping with the code DAX at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped. Dot com and use code DAX. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tool for the job with Manscaped. Well, DAX Harwood, we are the the pinnacles happening. You know, you've been off TV, but the following week you get back on TV and you get back on TV in a singles match, very high profile, because Chris Jericho pinned Dax Harwood in 13 minutes and 21 seconds on the April 14th Dynamite with Mike Tyson as the ringside enforcer. Uh, Tyson took a chair away from Jericho when he wanted to use it. Um, you got Jericho's bat, but Tyson took that away from you. Um, uh, Dax and uh, Tyson, you and Tyson squared off as they went to commercial. This is... So much stuff, fun stuff happening. Uh, Guevara distracted you and Jericho hit the Judas effect for the pin. Uh, this was kind of the first featured match for Dax Harwood, was it not? Yeah. And, uh, you know, still one of my favorites I've ever had. Uh, I remember going into it thinking and understanding this was the most high profile match I probably would ever have, especially singles matches. You got Mike Tyson, one of the prop, you know, up there with, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, maybe a few pegs down, but the most uh, widely known uh, sports celebrity, you know, of all time, one of the most widely known sports celebrities of all time. And so I knew extra eyeballs would be on us. And then they were, we did a great rating for that match for that night. Uh, but I also remember going into this match and thinking to myself, I don't give a shit if he's Mike Tyson. Right. Uh, and I know he's got faster hands than me and he could knock me out. Right. But, I don't give a shit if he's Mike Tyson. I'm not going to show any fear, and I'm going to stand right into him, right up to him face to face, um, and I'm not going to back down from him. And I remember also thinking going into this match, um, I don't care if this is Chris Jericho, a legit future Hall of Famer, one of the greatest of all time in our business. I'm going to show him why we are in the same ring together tonight. I'm going to match his intensity and take it even further. Uh, I'm going to try my best to blow him up. I couldn't. Uh, which is a testament to him, but I, I'm going to work my ass off and, and I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be who Dax Harwood is and I'm not going to take a back seat because this guy has been doing it for 30 plus years. Uh, and like I said, a legit hall of famer. So I was ex super excited about this match, had a ton of ideas. Uh, and I, I just watched this match last week and I loved it. What a moment you get to face off with Tyson and that's not, exaggerating especially if you're my age mike tyson is our muhammad ali and to see mm -hmm. him and you on in a match together it's pretty amazing what happened with cash in that match as well because he had an eventful match as well uh well an I'll eventful never, moment you know i'll never tell you guys can ask him at the uh 
at the live at the live show if uh, he really got un- knocked unconscious or not. But I will say that Mike Tyson had some fast ass hands that night, and my best friend got on one of the most replayed uh, segments of AEW Dynamite ever. Imagine being able to tell your family, your friends, um, you know, if he eventually has he eventually has kids, if if they if he gets to tell them that Mike Tyson, one of if not the greatest boxer of all time, knocked me out. That's pretty cool. So we're setting up blood and guts, uh, which is going to be, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's going to be an episode of dynamite, but it's a one match, one live match for the live crowd and taped for everybody else. And we're approaching it. Uh, Jim Ross interviews the pinnacle on April 21st. Uh, MJF did a promo. He really laid it on Jericho. You know, it, it seems like it's all max, right? Uh, yep. That's exactly what it seems like. And that's exactly what I told Max, you know, and, and, you know, we talked about this with the, uh, FTRKO episode that Randy always made sure, always made sure and always fought for me and cash that the three of us were on equal playing field. Cause he said when he was in evolution, Hunter did the same for him, uh, uh, flair and Batista hmm. that they weren't just, they weren't just cannon fodder. For, right. for for to, uh, for Triple H, they were on the same level, and if they were going to take bumps, Hunter was going to take bumps too. Uh, and so, you know, I tried to explain that to Max, but it just never got through to him. Probably because he's a little, little uh, too egotistical for his own good. Uh, thinks he knows a little too much for his own good. Um, but yeah, yeah. Again, um, you know, the the segment was. Uh, all about Max talking and was Max furthering his angle with, with Jericho. And so still we hadn't met just speaking for myself and cash. We hadn't had an opportunity yet to heat up our stuff with Santana and Ortiz. Right. Because the idea was, you know, Hager and Wardlow y'all and Santana and Ortiz. And you just have these promos, like in the same episode, uh, Chris Jericho, comes out talking about Mike Tyson punching cash, um, came out with straws because the pinnacle was now the pineapple. That's what he called it. And then Jericho um, wrote a song about the pinnacle. Um, You know, this seems, I don't know, in the history of wrestling, usually it's kind of a thing where you want to make your opponents at least look like a credible threat. And I think, was that missing a little bit here? Uh, Well, you know, yeah, yeah. You want to, you want to make your opponents look like a credible threat. Um, but you know, especially as heels, man, like the heels aren't going to draw the money. And I've said that, you know, on multiple episodes, the heels aren't here to draw the money. The heels are here to make the baby faces draw money, but the heels have to be positioned in a th- have to be positioned as a threat so that baby face can draw more money because if the baby face just beats us like a drum every week and there's nothing for that baby face to overcome you know what i mean uh and that's the most important aspect of being a baby face is overcoming obstacles whether it's a match or an angle that baby face has to overcome obstacles and i just don't think other than the first the the initial incarnation of the pinnacle we had put any obstacles in their way to overcome that. Uh, this is all heading towards blood and guts. There's a promo on um, the next dynamite, April 28th, where it seems, you know, like there's two different ways to go about this. Like Sammy Guevara does a promo on Sean Spears, basically calling him a failure in AEW, you know, but on the other side, you guys do a promo against Antonio Ortiz. You don't call them failures, but you say, you personally say, Hey, uh, Ortiz, you have a son, Santana, you have a daughter, kiss them goodbye when you leave. Cause you might not see them again. Those are two different ways to approach promoting a match, right? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think so. That was, that was our face to face we had with everybody. Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what, right. We that, that's I, what I love that. I love that segment. I, I thought that was awesome. And I thought that's what we needed. And, you know, we probably needed a few weeks prior, uh, but yeah, um, I wanted to make 
our issue with Santana and Ortiz um, personal because those personal issues are what the people at home can connect with. Um, and if the baby face in this is my opinion, if the baby face Sammy is calling um, Sean Spears a failure in AEW. And I think he even said, he talked about him alluded to him being a failure in WWE as well. Um, right. And the fans already, and I say this res- respect to one of my best friends in the wrestling business, uh, Sean Spears, the fans already have that perception of him because of the way he was booked. They, they perceive him to be, you know, a failure. So if our baby face is calling our heel that, then does that really make him a baby face? You know, um, if he would have said, you know, something to the effect of you haven't, you, you know, you haven't uh, been able to, to reach the potential or whatever you, you think you have. And he said, but I know how good you are and I know how dangerous you are, but none of that matters because on like in March 31st, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Right. And maybe, you know, we, there, there's something there uh, for Santana and Ortiz. <clears throat> my whole thought process with these guys for our angle. Uh, and if you don't want to talk about it here, cause I am, cause I'm going to be fast forwarding a little bit, you That's can fine. Me, no, but my whole thought process was two entities, right? Santana and Ortiz who grew up in not the best conditions, you know, in, in the Bronx uh, and myself and cash who grew up in not the best conditions in North Carolina. We look different. We sound different, right? And with all these differences, there's still commonality between the four of us. I think you and Santana Ortiz have more in common than any other tag team. Yes. In uh, AW. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted those guys to beat us. And it was going to be this knockdown, drag out war, right? And I don't know if you remember, but I can send a picture. Uh, Cash and I had North Carolina bandanas made that we we wore once or twice on TV. Right. And they they already wore their uh their bandanas as well. And um I wanted at the end of the feud, as soon as it was over, I wanted them to beat us and it was going to be this knockdown drag out war and we get up and that was going to be the start when this feud was over. That was going to be the start of our babyface turn. Um, but what was going to happen was they were going to stand above us. We were going to be down on our ass after they beat us. We stand up. We get face to face with them. They take their bandanas. Uh, we take our bandanas. We shake hands and we both tie each bandana around the the, the respective hands. That was my idea. And that's how I the angle was going to be played out and that's how well that's how i wanted it to be played out um so i knew we had to get personal in a hurry especially if you know we didn't have a ton of tv time backing that for the for for the two of us the two the two teams this is all leading to the pinnacle beats the inner circle in the blood and guts match uh at aw dynamite uh the inner circle came out prisoner outfits from the local prison uh, and, and, uh, you guys came out, I think you guys were wearing like all white, right? Yes. A lot of white, sh- uh, you know, cause blood looks great on white right. and, uh, the, the idea is war games. So it's a war games type match, except it's all submit or surrender. There's no pinfalls allowed. Um, talk a little bit about, I guess the idea of the match, the planning of the match, how you felt it was going to play out as you guys started it. Yeah, I was really, really, really excited about the match. Um, and I was slated to go in first, me and Sammy Guevara, uh, to kind of set the pace and set the tone for the the, the rest of the match. Um, and I was very uh, excited and honored that, that I was given that uh, nod to go in first, to go in first, um, because I knew that I could go in with Sammy, who up until that point had been featured or positioned as a just a high flyer uh they done all the tricks but i wanted to sh- teach him but also uh show the fans 
that he was also or could be an ass kicker. So I spent all that time bumping around as a heel would and falling on my ass and having to give me backdrops. And I remember that was the that was the biggest crowd uh, we Cash and I had seen in AEW up until that point because of the pandemic. Right. Uh, and I remember we had like a maybe 5,000 people there. I, I could be wrong, but we had a lot of people there. And just, and that was the, again, the first time we had those people there. And I remember just bumping my ass off because of the adrenaline the people were giving us. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show that Sammy was not just a high flyer or a trick guy, he was an ass kicker too. And Sammy is spectacular. And the idea of you two starting together works really well because you have the double A position. You're the first guy in and Sammy's a guy who can go for a long time. And he's got all these spectacular moves. Uh, one by one people come in. Um, uh, eventually you're completely uh, covered in blood. Uh, there's chairs involved. Um, you know, there's thing, you know, Guevara and Spears were standing on the top rope and Ortiz hit Spears with a chair shot and, um, used it in, and then Guevara used a Spanish fly. There's so many things going on. Uh, Wardlow, uh, coming in cash covered in blood, Jake Hager coming in. It is just, just craziness. <laughs> what do you recall about all the craziness once it gets to be five on five? Uh, I, I I remember the the two teams were separated and we came together like a like a big uh, the brave heart kind of scene. Yeah, that didn't work, did it? Uh, it did okay. I thought I thought. Was, that, did you guys all get hung up in the ropes or something? No. Well, that was the that was the idea because okay. I mean it, it wasn't like we were gonna we were running to crawl through the ropes. It was supposed to be we all get there and it looks nasty and it looks. You know, so it didn't, right. it didn't look fluid, but, uh, that's the thing I think that annoys me the most about wrestling today is a lot of the wrestlers think that it has, everything has to be fluid, but it doesn't. Um, but I, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the match. I enjoyed that moment. Um, I, you know, I just know that we all wanted to make it special. And it is something that's, uh, remembered and maybe not for the right reasons, because you guys are all working your ass is off. You guys are getting hurt. People are falling in between the cage and the, 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 the ring. People are going up to the rooftop. But what most people remember is, first of all, the way the match ended, which is, you know, getting Guevara to, to throw in the towel because they didn't want Jericho uh, to get thrown off the cage. And then after the match is over, Jericho gets thrown off the cage. And most people remember Jericho falling through what was not the best looking landing device. If you're trying to get lost into the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the magic of pro wrestling. Um, did you get a lot of feedback about that after the match? Did you have any thoughts about that after the match? Uh, yeah, that, that, that finish, that ending, how it went down did kind of suck, you know, like it was, it, it wasn't to the fault of any of the performers. Um, I just think that, Again, this was during the pandemic era, so we were all working without a net on how to shoot things. Uh, Daly's Place kind of made it a, a little difficult to shoot, but that's the the cards we were dealt. Um, first blood and guts match ever in AEW. And again, like I said, working on live TV without a net. So it was, you know, the way it was shot is the reason that it was uh kind of sat the, the fans soured on it right and again I, I don't blame the the cameramen or the directors the producers nobody knew it was just those are the cards that we were dealt so when i say that you know it was the way it was shot i don't mean that in a bad way i just mean that we were all still in the process of learning how to deal with this uh pandemic era style of wrestling I thought the idea for the finish was great. Um, I thought that uh, the execution going into it was was done well. Um, it's just the the way it was shot uh, probably could have been thought through a little bit more, uh, considering the small confines of the, of Daly's place. How frustrating is that for you and the other performers that you guys like? 
I mean, you guys are just brutalizing each other. You guys are brutalizing them yourselves. There's blood everywhere. People legit getting hurt. And all the fans can talk about is this one bad camera shot. Yeah. Uh, it, it was embarrassing. Um, you know, and I think it kind of, if you think about it, uh, God, <laughs> um, it just didn't help the feud at all. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it, it probably hindered it more than anything. So, uh, you know, I think I, you know, we had, like you said, we had worked so hard to make this match special. And I think it was pretty special, decently special um, and and good up until that one moment. And then, like you said, that's all everyone can talk about and everyone can remember. But it is weird also to me that the, the same people that shit on it, shit on the finish, also would have shit on it if it looked too dangerous. Right. And, you know, they would have said that we weren't taking enough care of our talent. We were throwing right. caution to the wind. Um, so to those people, and, and it's not everybody, it's not all, all of AEW's fans or all of wrestling fans. It's just to a, to a certain group of people. There is no pleasing them. So you, you have to sometimes pick your poison. Uh, but, you know, in saying that in the defense of those fans, it could have been shot a little better. And it is talking about the booking philosophy and how now we have inner circle losing after you guys getting your cup up. It's, it's like this back and forth thing. I think it's a booking philosophy of AEW where they're trying to build up the best matchup versus building up a compelling reason to see a show, right? Like if you would have booked it, like it was the eighties, you would have booked it totally different, but now you guys are kind of going back and forth. Um, is that a difference in philosophy that you have from how AEW sometimes booked, or do you have thoughts on that at all? Uh, so for me, the way I would have booked it, I guess, uh, again, like I've said a million times on this show, right or wrong, doesn't mean I'm right. I'm just saying this is how, if I were the booker, I would have booked it. Um, I would have pre presented us as a threat for a while. Um, and I would have had, uh, I would have had the pinnacle winning matches up until that point into the big cage match. And if that wasn't the blow off, then the finish that we did was, would, would have been perfect, you know, and, and it wasn't a blow off. So that finish would have worked great because it got us heat made us look more like a threat, but I would have positioned us as, uh, uh, with a, I would position the pinnacle more glowingly than what we had been presented uh, up until that point, because <clears throat> now instead of being a dominant heel faction that nobody could take down, nobody could beat, nobody could get the upper hand on, and we beat the inner circle, we were just guys who had already been beat and we beat the inner circle. And let's not forget that MJF stood on top of the cage without any other member of the pinnacle and got all the glory for himself. Was that something that you talked about later? Oh yeah, Matt. I think you know me a little too well to know that I wouldn't go to the back and have words with. Yeah, congratulations uh, on winning, goddammit. <laughs> yeah. But the pinnacle and the inner circle still had issues. For some reason, there's still more feud to be done. Like I'm not sure where you go after you drop Jericho 20 feet to the ground, after everybody gets bloody and beaten. But we're working towards the stadium match. So on the May 12th, Dynamite, the Pinnacle came out celebrating. MJF noted uh, MJF noted that they were number one in cable that week. Oh, by the way, Blood and Guts drew a huge rating, right? Mm -hmm. it, it did really, really well. Um, and that's when he started calling himself the Demo God. Um, they said they had a Canadian hero in the match, Sean Spears. He said the inner circle wants a rematch. Um, and Tully Blanchard started talking, saying that they took everything the inner circle could dish out and they submitted. And that's the end of the story. They quit. That's what Tully said. And Blanchard gave everybody expensive, uh, watches, but then horn started honking. Here comes the inner circle. I forgot this happened. 
Uh, I did came, not. <laughs> they came out and they gave you the Kurt Angle slash Steve Austin slash maybe not quite the same bath of bubbly from the truck. Uh, Dax Harwood, talk about getting the bubbly bath from the truck after winning this match. Uh, I just remember that I had a really expensive suit on and really expensive shoes because, man, you know, at the beginning, uh, we were all into this pinnacle thing. We thought it was going to take off and going to be the, you know, the biggest thing for AEW. So we spent, I'm not even exaggerating, dude, probably each of us probably spent $10,000 and I'm not exaggerating in money on suits and shoes and belts, uh, and outfits together. Uh, we had the, the guy that was in the, um, when, when, uh, inner circle attacked us, the guy that was fitting us for, uh, suits, right. Shoot. David Allen, great suit maker makes John Cena suits. Shoot had been brought in by us to fit us for a multitude of suits. And we got like seven suits. And so I'm not kidding, dude, we spent like $10,000 on all these suits. But <laughs> I just remember I was wearing this suit like an idiot. And ruined the <laughs> suit, never could wear it again. The shoes got completely soaking wet. So, uh, having it in my uh, check bag on the way home uh, got even more disgusting. And uh, I had to throw away that very, very, very expensive ensemble. Uh, I also remember, <laughs> didn't even get caught on camera, but I stood up when we were getting shot with the bubbly, uh, which is a blue chew ad, if you think about it. Um, I was standing on top of a table. And got sprayed right in the face, which made me fall on the table. And I went through the table, broke the announce table, so to bring out a new table. Uh, yeah, uh, this was one of the sports entertainment things that Jericho wanted to introduce and to uh, the segment. And I kind of I understand his philosophy. They had gotten beaten. He'd gotten shoved, shoved off the top of a uh, a cage. And so, like, Instead of doing the typical, I'm going to get revenge on you, uh, he wanted to do something a little lighthearted, maybe. Um, so I can understand that. Uh, I don't know if it was executed as well as he probably would have wanted, but uh, you know, I understand the booking there. Let's talk a little bit about the influence there then, because you said there's something Jericho wanted to do. Uh, we talk, You talked about how Max kind of did things he wanted to do. We also have talked about very many times that everything's Tony Khan's call, but how much are you listened to versus how much is Chris Jericho listened to? Like to, uh, not as opposed to just feedback, but planning does Jericho have a lot to do with the creative in his own segments? Oh yeah. I, I would imagine Jericho, uh, at least from what I've seen, you know, he, he books his own segments. He, he, uh, I mean, whatever everybody thinks about his booking or his segments or whatever, he takes a lot of time and he's very meticulous in, uh, you know, in his, his angles and what he wants to produce. Um, that's very commendable, very respectful or respectable. Um, but yeah, yeah, this was, you know, this feud was, but I mean, as far as me and my ideas, uh, I think that's kind of uh, this where a little bit of my um, disinterest came along is uh, I had no thought or and had no input into, you know, any uh, of the angle. You know, I detailed what I wanted to do with Santana and Ortiz and how I wanted to make it this blood feud um, about two different ideologies or we thought were two different ideologies, but un underneath it all, we were all exactly the same and none of that came to fruition. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I had no input into the creative here. Well, I'm sure you said a thing or two. Um, <laughs> we, we are, uh, uh, heading towards double or nothing where we have the stadium match, uh, on May 28th. It was an inner circle celebration on Dynamite hosted by Eric Bischoff, who probably will not be returning to AEW television anytime soon. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Jericho noted that Bischoff and Jericho had made up. Uh, Bischoff said that 25 years ago, he came up with a faction and changed wrestling, and maybe they're the best faction ever. But he said the inner circle may replace them as the greatest faction of all time. They showed on the screen that MJF and Wardlow had beaten up 
Dean Malenko. They pushed that Malenko as one of Jericho's best friend. So they all <laughs> ran from Daly's place to the football field. But the pinnacle was hiding. You guys were hiding and you ambushed them and you beat the shit out of them. Spears used a chair shot on Guevara. FTR, you guys did the the tandem ball drivers uh, off the deck of the stadium simultaneously on Santana and Ortiz through a table. Uh, one of the tables didn't break. Um, this was on a Friday. Stadium Stampede was on a Sunday and everybody seemed to be fine by Sunday. Um, tell us about this particular segment. Uh, I really, really, really liked the segment a lot because at least it gave us some steam. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was brutal. It was, it was very brutal. Uh, I remember thinking that maybe the pile drivers through the table, uh, were a little much come Sunday, you know, but also I was thinking, my God, me and cash and Santana and Ortiz need a spark. We need something, um, to make this personal, to make this, uh, interesting for the four of us, um, and for people to, to, to talk about it. And so I, I knew that if we did that, at least for that episode of dynamite, which was the go home to stadium stampede, they would be talking about the pile drivers through the table. Um, and so that was selfishly you know, right or wrong. That's why we did it. Well, it definitely set it up like, you know, it introduced the idea of the stadium to the feud. And you'd said earlier in a promo, I didn't mention it, but you had said that you guys were going to collect all the belts and after you dealt with the inner circle, but you know, you don't have any belts now. And if you need one, of course, go see our good friend at main event belts, main event belts is the place you can go. If you've ever dreamed of being in the main event, because now you can, because main event belts is a championship belt making company that designs and makes custom belts to the same specifications. You see in the top promotions, they've made them for Harley race. They made it for Jake Roberts, DDP, Vader, Jerry Lawler, and more. They've worked with many promotions around the world who are looking for quality and affordable price. I mean, if you're a promoter, you need a professional looking championship belt. The main event belts is where you need to look no further. Want your replica to be more like the real belts you see in the top promotions? You can replace the plastic with real leather. The main event belts leather crafters can do this. Want to make your belt sparkle? You can replace the plastic uh, stones with Swarovski's or cubic zirconias. It's a real championship belt. And guys, you can have them custom made for a work event, a wedding, school, or celebration, just like we saw the Super Bowl champions just had one. It is time to make your main event dreams come to life. Contact main event belts at gmail.com or just go to www.maineventbelts.com. They ship worldwide. And right now they can offer you a real championship belt starting from $9.99. It's $999 for a real quality championship belt like you've always wanted. But use the promo code FTR10. You get 10% off your first order. We're saving you a hundred bucks, folks. Um, make sure, guys, to support our sponsors, especially main event belts. We love them for advertising with us. They make great stuff. And uh, Dax, if you don't get a belt in the future, that may be where you need to get one from. Well, absolutely. I'm going to get one. I've talked about it before. Um, you see the three right here behind my uh, left shoulder, but also have the uh, off camera. Well, you only have the WWE belt showing, Dax. What does that mean? That's what does that mean, Dax? Huh? Planting, huh? <laughs> planting a seed, brother. Planting a seed. Uh, beside those, I have the AEW World Tag Team Championships, AAA World Tag Team Championships, Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championship, and the IWGP Tag Team Championships. So my idea was, as I told you before, is to get a legacy belt made to commemorate Cash and I holding all seven belts nine different times. Uh, and I'm going to get one for cash and myself, but also I'm going to get one, uh, for approximately 20 to 25 fans where cash and I will sign them. Uh, and those lucky fans will be picked randomly and be, uh, have the opportunity to get those belts. And, uh, that's our plan with our friends at maineventbelts.com. Uh, and I cannot wait to see the finished product he has for us. And by the way, guys, the reason I haven't talked to you about this, but I'm just guessing you have the belts up on your wall in order of when you won them. Is that correct? Um, yes, I do. Except for I realized, I'm not even kidding, like three days ago, 
I have the SmackDown and the Raws in the wrong position. So I have NXT here, then it's supposed to be Raw, then SmackDown here, then AEW, which is right beside it, then AAA, which is right beside it, followed by Ring of Honor, followed by IWGP. It's just like you said, like you said, the order of when the the titles we went first. Right. So those of you who like to zoom in on Dax's background now know the answer. Um, so we're headed towards now. We're there. We're there. We're at Double or Nothing 2021. Uh, it's a different Double or Nothing. It's not in Vegas. It's at the uh, um, you know the Daily's, Daily's place. place and the Inner Circle, which is Jericho, Hager, Guevara, Ortiz, and Santana beat the pinnacle, which is y'all MJF Wardlow and Sean Spears. Um, you know what? We haven't talked enough about Wardlow. Uh, you guys, it appeared, it appears you guys have formed kind of a relationship, a friendship with him. Oh, yeah. You guys, uh, ended up tagging with him later in the last vestiges of, of the, uh, um, of the pinnacle. It seems like kind of, he was almost like you were talking about Brock Anderson before, except he was much further along kind of like the big Bubba Rogers, like the guy who's kind of figuring it out. He comes in a little bit of time, but more and more we see now Wardlow's the dude, like he's great. Talk about, uh, working with Wardlow a little bit. Yeah, dude, uh, cash and I are, but at the time we're very, very good friends with Wardlow and Sean Spears. We love those two guys so much. And over the course of our AEW tenure, uh, we became even closer with Wardlow and he's uh, what I consider in the business. One of my best friends, we talk all the time um, through text. And uh, when we see each other, we always give each other a big hug, tell each other how much we love each other. Um, you know, because I think that it, the, the, the bond started out of obviously wrestling, but um, I always took the time and cash as well, always took the time to give him little pointers uh, and, and tell him what he could have done differently. And we, we you know, we made time to watch all of his matches. Um, and he actually uh, always wanted to be at ringside with us, me and cash. And um, he, he, I think he'll tell you that's where he started um, exercising. Some of his uh, charisma was, were in those, matches when he was on the floor with us he started getting comfortable out there um and having fun and he realized you know he doesn't have to be this stoic badass uh 24 hours a day he can show glimpses of personality and humor and things like that um he can't you know and when i when we talked i told him you know i said you can't you can't flip flop to complete comedian you know, back to badass but you can show these little glimpses of who he really is he's really a funny guy uh, super, super, super sweet guy too. Very, very nice. Um, studies the business, loves, loves professional wrestling, has progressively gotten better. And I think everybody can see that, but he has progressively gotten better. And, you know, you hear so many wrestlers today say, oh, I love the fans. He, ha- he loves his fans, dude. Uh, he will take all the time in the world. So I, I, you know, have uh, I'm an admit, I have an immense amount of respect for Wardlow as a wrestler and a human being, and I love him, dude. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I hope he knows that I love him so much. The uh, and the fans love him too, especially the female fans. Yeah, uh, Wardlow has got quite well, kind of like me, huh? Hey, same thing, same thing. You guys have that. you guys draw the same exact demo, I yeah. think. Um, the the stadium match, um, stadium stampede, they call it uh alliteration is important in wrestling uh what was the planning idea of of that match what was the way you saw it most importantly where was your attitude at this point uh i think my attitude was probably at the time maybe a bit combative i mean i was very excited to be in the main event of the pay-per-view, you know, or, or one of the main events of the pay-per-view. I was excited to do a stadium stampede because that is a um, staple in AEW. Uh, I was very, I was looking forward to that. I also wanted to make sure that um, our segment with Ortiz and Santana war, was the most realistic and brutal and hard hitting part of it. Um, I enjoyed the, the, the spot in the, uh, I know it was a little bit entertaining, a little bit entertainment, but I enjoyed the spot in the bar scene with us. What was supposed to happen in that bar scene, everything happened the way it was. Uh, you know, we had the, we fought all the people inside the bar and man, I wish I could tell you all the names of all those extras because 
one, they none of them complain. Not one time did they complain and they worked their ass off, dude. We stayed up until I'm not kidding, four or four thirty in the morning morning filming our segment. Um and not one of those uh, extras complained. They were bumping on the floor, which they didn't have to, but they were. They were bumping their ass off on the floor. And I wish I had every individual name of those uh, those extras because they worked equally as hard as we did to make us look good. And so I thank them. If you're listening and you were there, uh, you get a chance to tag yourself on Twitter and tag me on Twitter. Please do. Uh, and I'll try to give you your just due because you – did incredible. Thank you so much. But uh, the part where Tully pours the, we, we beat up everybody in the, in the uh, bar and there's a table left with uh, you know, we all come together at a table. Tully comes over with the, the vodka and pours four shots. We take the shots and then we flip the table over and start brawling. What was supposed to happen was when we flip the table, as soon you know, cause it also zooms in on, uh, you know, on, um, Conan. Yeah, like, Conan makes a makes a cameo. Yeah, there's supposed, there supposed to be two different things that were going to happen here. Uh, I I suggested we have Conan there as the DJ, uh, which we did, which I thought was awesome. But also, uh, when Cash and I we were supposed to be film a scene where Cash and I uh, were walking in the bar and with 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 Tully, and uh, we had just ran away from Ortiz and Satana. We walked in the bar and there was supposed to be a, a, a bar there and sitting at the bar was someone by himself with his back to us. And we got the okay from Tony to do this. We just had to get up with him. We walk up to the bar. We sit down at the bar and the person you know, with the guy at the bar and the guy at the bar was going to be Terry Funk. And wow. yeah, we were, he was, um, he was supposed to say a line from Roadhouse. I can't remember what it was, uh, but he was supposed to say a line from Roadhouse. Uh, and we were going to take a drink with him or something. And then in comes Santana and Ortiz. Then we go into the brawl. Uh, and then we, we see Conan. When we see Conan uh, and we flip the table over to start the brawl, when we flip the table over, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to hit the, the first a uh, few seconds of DMX party up. And that was supposed to start the big brawl inside, and we were right. going to play like uh, twenty seconds of party up. Uh, right. But that got ixnade. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I I really enjoyed it. So the the process is everything f- was filmed before, except maybe the stuff on the football field. Is that kind of the way it works, or um, was? it pieced together live or any idea how like did, did other people film the night before as well or the day before as well? I'm not really sure about other other people. And honestly, I've never even seen the match. Never have I watched the match. Uh, I just know what we did with Santana and Ortiz. And that was, it was filmed the, uh, night before. Um, uh, real quick on the Terry Funk story. So we had, we were tasked with the, the, um, what, was Terry just unable to make it? Is that what happened? So we called Terry. Cash did. He called Terry, and we couldn't get a hold of him. We called him again, left him a message, couldn't get a hold of him, couldn't get a hold of him. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe a week later, if that, uh, Cash gets a phone call. He looks at it, and it says he even screenshotted uh, this, but it said Terry Funk. <laughs> so Cash <laughs> answered. And Cash explained everything to him. And Terry said, oh, I would love to do that. And he said, oh, well, I'm sorry. We've already filmed it. You know, we filmed it uh, however many days before. And he said, that's why we were trying to get up with you. And, and you know, Terry was very apologetic. And uh, so he was down to do it. But it just, he got called back uh, a bit too late. It just didn't come together. Just didn't uh, the match did come together for people watching at home. Uh, I know it did for me. I didn't realize or even kind of detect all those edits that they had to be made. There was a special on A&E about the Boiler Room match or the Mankind Undertaker feud. And the Boiler Room match, they did the same thing. They recorded the night before. And if you haven't seen that, folks, Oof. behind the, the but the, the A&E special oh. shows them after the cut, 
after it's over. Oh, and okay. freaking mankind is laying on the hallway, just face down, just, you know, and then Vince walks up and he goes, all right, guys, take two. <laughs> and they laughed. Oh, okay, because okay. <laughs> it wasn't real. Yeah. Um, but it's just amazing what you can do with post-production. You have to give credit to AEW for making this thing work because so many ways it could have gone wrong. Mm-hmm. But the match ended, of course, um, with uh, Sammy Guevara using a a GTS, kicking Spears into a chair and pinning him uh, after a 630. And, you know, that's pretty much the end of our story this week. Um, Just a couple questions, and then maybe we'll take a couple from Twitter. Uh, The booking overall, we've talked about how maybe it wasn't conducive as the way that you've seen it historically to want to make people see a match. Do you think maybe it was booked a little backwards where maybe the blood and gut should have been the last thing. Maybe the, the bubbly bath should have happened early on. Maybe, you know, a lot of things. It, it seems very strange to me. The stadium match happened after the blood and guts. Yeah, I, I get that. I understand that. But we uh, had to book the blood and guts, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm pretty sure I'm right. We had to book the blood and guts then at that time because the network wanted it. And again, that's what I tell you, like even for, for Vince, um, sometimes you have to book things for the network because they're paying you a shit ton of money. So you have to, you know, you have to kind of, you know, play within their, their guidelines. Um but even so, I don't know if I would have done blood and guts after uh, Stadium Stampede. I understand that, you know, for most of wrestling's existence, the cage match has been the blow off. But Stadium Stampede is only uh, associated with AEW. It's AEW's staple. It's, it is their blow off, you know. Um, blood and guts, I know blood, the blood and guts name is AEW's, but you know you know facing facts it's a war games match and uh war games is associated with wcw and wwe actually has the name that they can use and they do use so i completely understand why the stadium stampede was booked last uh plus the baby face going over in stadium stampede is the right decision there um so that's that's why you know i guess i guess to encapsulate everything i just said sometimes you got to book for the network uh and that's not always ideal but i mean you know you 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 have to do that and i i agree that city of stampede could have come in last uh i'm looking at these twitter questions and we seemed to have answer them all <laughs> like okay. it seems you know there's one about did you ever think about doing a faction with cody you know um what was the deal where was they were to go after jericho's head, uh flushed mjf's head in the toilet um could you see yourself in a new version of the horseman um i think we did a good job of answering all these questions i have a I couple get, of them oh go ahead go ahead go ahead so this is from uh you know one of uh ftr's biggest fans and a good friend of ours, uh, Jackie Rodriguez, uh, at love you make 24. She huge, said huge FTR, fan. huge FTR fan. And she did the right thing of using the hashtag FTR with Dax. She said, was there ever consideration to have a female member of the pinnacle? And there was, um, there were two, we really wanted Brit and there was talks of Brit being in the group, but Brit is a standalone star, you know, sh- no one needs to, to mess with her. She's, she's great. Um, and then the other one that I really wanted and talked to Tony about, he was, you know, he was pretty, um, excited at the, at the idea was Serena Deeb. Um, right. she had been up until that point, she'd been a baby face, but I thought she really fit what pinnacle was, especially cash and myself, you know, just a, a, an incredible wrestler uh, who is considered, you know, she's considered a pretty big badass too um, among the women. So that those are the two that, um, and I, I think the closest was probably Serena Deeb. Did you have another question from Twitter? Um, it said from second city, AEW fan at, I think I won't says if you could using the hashtag FTR with next, 
if you could go back and change one thing about the group, what would it be? Uh, I wouldn't have joined it. That'd be what I changed. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I could change one thing. Um, yeah. I don't know, man. That's a loaded question. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't really know. I'd like to think about that and maybe answer it either next time or, or next week or something, but that, that is a, that's a loaded question. Why do you think when we tweeted that this was the subject that Sean Spears retweeted it and just used the hashtag DOA? <laughs> I didn't know that he did that. Oh he God, did. dude, that's a shoot pop. Right <laughs> Woo. Well, Spears is going to get more heat than I am. Hell yeah. Thank you, Spears. Yes. You take some away from me. We love you for that, uh, um, Mr. Spears. Yes, I do. Spears is finally, you know, branching out and understanding how good he is and that uh, he doesn't always have to keep his mouth shut if he doesn't want to. Um, because I think that one person in the group probably thought that he was bigger than the group, maybe, and probably felt that this was uh, just designed for him, maybe. Um, and maybe he wasn't the only person that thought that, too. Uh, so that's the real subject, right? Like, you guys felt like this could be a dangerous alliance faction, but there's some feeling among some people, maybe you, maybe Sean Spears, that really it was a vehicle for Max, and you guys were just details. Is that? Uh, well, I don't think at first we thought that. I think at first someone and a, maybe a couple of other people uh, outside of our group too uh, felt that this was a vehicle for just him and them. Uh, we felt, us and, and Wardlow, um, we felt that, and I say us being me, Cash, Spears, and Wardlow, felt that if we all work together, we could all get over and we could right. all get each other over. And obviously Max was going to be the main event guy winning the, the world belt. We, we knew that, but we felt that everybody could benefit from this, from this group and in turn benefit who we individually work with and in turn benefit AEW's business. Uh, just didn't pan out that way. And it's a proven formula, a heel champion with a heel group behind him, you know, the horseman, the NWO DX it's happened before. So that's not crazy to think of, uh, looking back at the lost opportunity of the pinnacle. What is your fondest memory of the pinnacle? Uh, whenever the fondest memory of the pinnacle, one of two, uh, one, wherever, when, when, uh cash and i were wrestling i believe it was the guns i could be mistaken but i think it was the guns when we finally started getting cheered max came out with us and he handed us our belts and we walked past him and that was the end of the pinnacle uh or unfortunately whenever cash got his arm completely ripped open from that hook uh and I'll send you a picture of that and let you post it if you want on our Twitter account. But that was a scary, scary, scary situation for us uh, and led to us almost quitting the business. And that is a topic for another time. And of course, not to downplay it, because that's something we're going to talk at length about uh, at some point. But a topic for another time as well is Dax Harwood, do you have from Twitter using the hashtag FTR with Dax? a non-wrestling question of the week. Every week you put it out there, you say, Hey, what is your non-wrestling question of the week? We get them from all over the place. Do you have one this week? I do. Um, using the hashtag FTR with Dax from Michael Davis at B underscore Michael Davis. He said the best place in Asheville to get food. Asheville is a beautiful city. Um, ton of mom, mom and pop places to eat. Everything is good. I mean, um, we have the Aloha Cafe, which is incredible. Uh, we have Tupelo Honey, which is incredible. Um, let's see. We have Wasabi Sushi, great sushi. And we have Silver Ball Subs, maybe the best subs I've ever had in my entire life. And that's me traveling around the world 
they are incredible. Um, but uh, one place I would suggest everybody in Asheville go eat at is Rocky's Hot Chicken Shack. It is, oh my God, life changing food. Uh, the chicken is obviously is is. There, there's no words. I have no words. I have zero words to tell you how good it is. The, uh, the, the corn pudding is phenomenal. The sweet potato casserole equally for phenomenal, uh, fried pickles, uh, the chicken dip, everything is great. And then on top of that, they've got draft beers. Um, that is the place I would suggest going to get food. Um, but in Nashville where I'd suggest you get your coffee, Summit Coffee for Foundy Street in the River Arts District. Uh, and you get to see all the river, or excuse me, all the river. You do get to see all the river, but you get to see all the uh the artwork that is done and and all the graffiti that is painted all over the um the beautiful graffiti on all the buildings. It's such a great place. Asheville, I would suggest everybody just uh, maybe not everybody, but if you move to Asheville, come hang out with me and I'll take you everywhere you need to go. A lot of great music, a lot of great musicians out there, too. Yes. It is known as a music town. Uh, of course, guys, make sure to uh, to get tickets for our live show in L.A., Mania Weekend. So it can be the biggest event, not the biggest event, but the biggest kickoff event of the whole weekend. Get your tickets at FTRwithDax.com. Next week, uh, we are going to do something interesting on the show. We are going to do March Madness the greatest tag teams of all time. We're hard at work seeding and bracketing these tag teams. And we also might, I mean, fair is fair. We've got a uh, AW pay-per-view coming up. It's coming up Saturday or Sunday. I'm not 100% sure. I'll watch it when it does. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit too, since we did talk about Elimination Chamber. I know you don't sit around and watch a bunch of current wrestling, but in addition to our greatest tag teams of all time, March Madness brackets. I think that could be a fun show for next week. Yes, uh, uh, it's going to spark a lot of de- a lot of debate. Um, and we are talking about the tag team brackets, right? The tag team brackets, not just the actual basketball brackets. Okay, right. it's going to spark a ton of debate. A ton of people are going to hate me uh, and hate you too. I hope you're ready for that. Oh, it's already going on. <laughs> But when it comes to tag team wrestling, I don't know too many people, you know, in, in wrestling in general too. And I, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm kind of like ashamed of it, how much I watch and how much I've studied. Uh, but there aren't too many people who have studied the amount of tag teams and the amount of tag team matches that I have. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know who I'm going to have as the, the winner, but I am looking forward to it. And, you know, you said that we were going to be able to also print out some of the, bra- or have uh, available printout brackets for right. fans to play along too, we're right? We're going to have them available for sure. Yeah. So, so we'll, uh, we'll post the, uh, all the, the, the brackets and the teams and the seedings and things like that. And that's already going to start debate. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. But it's it's good, all in fun, and uh, I'd love to see comparisons uh, to well the comparisons you and I have, but also the comparisons to um, the fans of FTR. Well, this is the Dax Harwood show, so your bracket is the master bracket. I will have one. I'll play along with the fans to close out the show, uh, Mister Harwood. Do you have a match of the week? I do. This is one I kind of talked about a few weeks ago, but we never actually made it a match of the week and it goes hand in hand with the tag team um, brackets. Uh, one of my favorite tag team matches of all time is the brain busters against the rockers. It's from January the 23rd, 1989 Madison square garden. And it is, uh, it has all the nuances that tag team wrestling should have. Um, it has these baby faces overcoming every single heel obstacle that's put in their way, whether it's a side headlock and they come out with a top wrist lock or uh, the, the heel slaps the baby face in the face and then the baby face fires back on him. Um, and then, in, you know, they seamlessly incorporate each member of the baby face team uh, into uh, the, into the match and it's interwoven so beautifully um and the flow is so incredible uh that's what tag team wrestling is you know two teams who know each other so well i mean know that their partners so well um and then they they work together to overcome their obstacles i I just think it's such a beauty um 
it's what tag team wrestling should and could be uh, if you just give it the time and the and you 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 as the wrestler um, devote enough of your brain power into making it a tag team match, not two singles matches. Uh, and it's a match that still holds up today. Arn and Tully against Sean and Marty MSG, January 23rd, 1989. Please watch it. And when you watch it, tag me, tag, uh, Matt, tag the uh, podcast Twitter account and let me know what you think, because I would love to know if my idea of what great tag team wrestling is, is yours too. It's a great match. Make sure to check it out. Dax, we didn't hear from our prospective guests, did we, during the course of the show? No, uh, we had some uh, we had some daughter stuff to take care of today. She was home. She was ready. I got everything hooked up. Um, oh, that prospective guest. Oh, my God. Sorry. I thought we were talking about another prospective guest. Uh, I, I did hear, uh, but I don't have a direct answer for you yet. Um, but we will in the coming days. Guests, right? Yes, Should, guests. Yeah, guests. All right, guys. So stay tuned to that and stay tuned to next week. It's going to be a very interesting show. We will see you next week on FTR with Dax Harwood. All right, by now, guys, you know I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be fun. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back or one day we want to upgrade the hardwood floors or remodel the kitchen or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know you can do better. With the mortgage though, you may not know this, the interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments. Buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. Or hey man, shoot me an email directly, Conrad at SaveWithConrad.com.